further ado, I'm your host, Spencer Nichols. I'm joined today by our CFO, D. Lewis, who is here up on stage, as well as Alan Helm, our Director of Accounts here at the Quinn Magazine. And of course, we're joined by the team at Nitro Betting. We have John Solomon, the Director of Operations, who will be talking a little bit more about the Bitcoin having challenge that we're putting on with them um, and how people can have the opportunity to win one Bitcoin in prizes by guessing the price of Bitcoin prior to the halving. Um, so yeah, anyway, uh, everyone welcome. Uh, John, how are you doing today? Welcome to the stage. Thank you so much. It's good to be back. It's good to see the audience. And uh, yes, uh, I was very happy to see uh, Bitcoin uh, hit the high number th earlier this morning. But yeah, we're seeing a little of that volatility. I think that's to be expected, though. But good to be here. Thank you again, Bitcoin Magazine. Of course, yeah. So to, to have you on. Uh, Dee and Alan, how are you guys doing today? I haven't felt this uh, roller coaster of emotions, I think, since uh, 2022. Uh, but hey, you know, I can't be mad. We hit a new all time high, and now stats are cheap. Then I can buy some more. <laughs> That's the attitude. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Uh, I'm doing good. Uh, I'm just trying to uh, figure out what number and what dart I'm throwing in the dark to figure out what price uh, Bitcoin will be at by the halving. Um, I mean, if today's any indication, I mean, I don't know if I can even guess it within the next five minutes, let alone, you know, in the next sort of 40, or 40 days or so. But, um, hey, that's part of the fun. Yeah, it's, uh, it's always interesting to see how Bitcoin subverts your expectations. I know there's been a lot of talk around, uh, you know, the, the four-year cycle as it relates to the halving. And, uh, you know, I, I think this is the first time that Bitcoin has hit an all-time high prior to the halving. So... Um, personally, I was like, oh, you know, if the four-year cycle is dead, I think we're not going to see any price action related to the halving or, or around that time period. And then it actually, the model broke to the upside. So, um, I mean, I think people in the Bitcoin space are well aware of the fact that all of your models are broken. But uh, in this case, for me, it was not in the way I expected. So, um, a welcome surprise, but I'm also glad to see a little bit of a pullback. Uh, cheap sats are good sats, in my opinion. So, uh, you know, wins and losses on both sides, but, but happy to be here nonetheless. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but Plan B's famous stock to flow model no. allegedly uh, <laughs> back in play, and I laugh at that at the perspective that uh, some of these fidelity guys might be shilling a bad chart. Uh, it's just it's funny to me to think about. Oh, was fidelity bringing that chart out today? Uh, maybe it was for die. I don't want to misspeak. Maybe it was BlackRock, but I've seen uh, I've seen that chart make a resurgence. It's just it's a little do they like know, I, little do they I, know the I, drama I, behind that. Well, one of the observations I've had, especially from you know like the traditional finance folks, is like they can't help themselves to uh, they can't but help themselves to try to sort of like impose a model on you know like the, the way they've understood all legacy markets. They have to impose it on bitcoin as well it's like how they've always viewed the, the the world so they have to sort of continue to apply that lens so you know they love bottles right and they love to try to understand what the price will kind of do it's just the world they come from and they just try to kind of apply how, how models have worked before on something that doesn't have a lot of history and data to be able to model for so it's always kind of this humorous thing that happens every cycle it's like all right well let's model it right and you even hear it from people that are new to bitcoin in terms of like well how do i value it right it's it's everyone tries to think of it all right how do i value a stock now how do i value this thing it's it's just it's something that completely i think breaks a lot of people's legacy ways of thinking about it yeah i hear the the, the classic I'm, I'm i'm new to bitcoin and i'm here to model it or i'm here to fix it uh and I think, I mean, I'm going to just die laughing if we see some of these, like, ETF issuers start posting, like, moon math in any newsletters. Um, I think, Alan, that's kind of what you were alluding to. But, uh, you know, shades of the, the 2020 to, to 2021 cycle uh, reappearing again. So, um, you know, maybe this time won't be different in that regard. The, uh, the, more, important, uh, the more important model here, and John, I'm curious to get your take. Uh, is, you know, guessing the price, the betting line, things that have been coming through, just curious on the, on the nitro betting family side of things, how people have been feeling today. What's your well, guess? Give me, so give me I, some alpha here. How can I win this? Yeah. Game? So, 
you know, my guess, you know, and I got to admit here, uh, I started my career back in the 90s on Wall Street. So I come from those institutions that, you know, anything that breaks through it or that resistance level, it starts to run. Uh, but that's not always the case when it comes to crypto, as I've learned over the years. Um, you know, I think that we're going to see a little resistance here uh, for the next few days, maybe a week or so. But, you know, I, I, I think by the having my guess, I think 73 is my number. Um, I'm, maybe I'm being a little conservative, but I, I think that's a realistic number with the resistance that I think we're going to see over the next few days. Well, I, I love that guess because uh, I think 73 is right about the number where Bitcoin in uh, purchasing power terms would be actually be returning to an all-time high. I know we hit the 69,000 all-time high back in 2021. Um, but if you account for inflation, I think, I think 73 is right about that number. So that would be interesting. It would be a, a true all time high for that to be at the, the, uh, the having, um, not in nominal terms. So, um, I, I like that. Yes. That's a good take right there. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Um, that's a s similar number I had and John, I was looking at some of the odds that you guys have a nitro betting right now in terms of is the price going to be over hundred K or under 50 K has the same odds right now. It's like an implied yeah. odds of about 20. And I was, and I sat back and I was like, all right, what would be more surprising to me right now? You know, let's say, let's say the having is, you know, like April 20th is feels like it's coalescing around there because of course it is. Right. And what would be more surprising me if it being, it being over a hundred or under 50. And I have to say, and this is recency bias, right? It always, it plagues all of us. I have to say under 50 would be um, more surprising just because the momentum and that recency bias that we're all victims to. Um, but if you kind of zoom out a little bit, 40, you know, 40 days ago, we were at 38K, right? I mean, things change really quickly. And so because we're all sort of victims to recency bias, we're like, all right, well, you know, we just tapped all time high. Let's keep this trend's got to keep moving. So I completely agree with you that. You know, this world probably a little bit overcooked. This thing really took off. We should average be very content, satisfied with that. And then I tweeted this too. And maybe it's because I'm just sort of a traditional token, boring finance guy. Um, but I like to take the conservative road as well. And I actually thought it was a good thing to see a sell off here. Maybe we chop sideways a little bit. And, you know, if I'm just going to be very boring and look at 50 and 100, split it down the middle and say, all right, by the having, it'll probably be about 73, 75. Right. And uh, I think that your odds I'm seeing on the on the book kind of are coalescing around that as well. But uh, I think that is the sort of reasonable. Right. Maybe it's not the, the super bullish thing that gets people uh, very excited. Um, I don't know why you wouldn't get excited whenever the Bitcoin price is at all time highs. But uh, people always want more. That's uh, one thing I've learned uh, quite a bit when it comes to Bitcoin. Yeah, they always want more. And I think obviously, if you're on the site, you can see, you know, uh, over 50,000 is by far the favorite right now. Um, I, I personally, I think I'm, I, I, I personally wouldn't be surprised if it actually dipped under 50. I'd actually be happy for purchasing power, but, um, and then to see it shoot back up. Um, you know, I think, by year's end, you know, we're touching close to 100, if not higher. But in the short term, you know, like I said, the betters, the public right now are betting with the over 50K. So that's 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 the trend that we're seeing right now here at Nitro. And also to kind of bring it back to what you said, D, of like seeing this pullback as something like positive. And like if we just kept like shooting up, you you kind of climb that, that wall of worry that, that people have mentioned. Um, and I think that's also just like, that's a healthy thing for, for this type of price action is seeing that pullback. I mean, we always want to be shaking at the weak hands. And I think like just generally in the market structure, that's also what we've seen with regards to these ETF flows. I mean, I think we're over a massive hurdle right now when it comes to GBTC selling. Um, you had the FTX estate liquidate their holdings. Uh, you had uh, Gemini, I believe, uh, was also going through a liquidation period there. Um, and so I think that there's, uh, yeah, I mean, personally, I'm just glad to see kind of that, that overhead or that, that kind of, uh, hat waiting to drop kind of get taken out of the equation. So from like a longer term perspective, I think it's really healthy for the market to have gone through this. And, uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to have all these other ETFs coming online, uh, and gobbling up that supply. But, but overall, I mean, I think this is like something that people should be glad to see, um, given if you're not trading or, uh, you know, hoping to flip one day to the next. But uh, that's just kind of my take is I think that there's a little bit more room to run for Bitcoin. You don't have this kind of specter of GBTC liquidations or 
over-exuberance hanging over the market. So for me, I'm like, oh, okay, like this is this is good, first of all, because I get cheap sats, but second of all, I think the market structure um, is a little bit healthier when we can get these pullbacks and, and digest these upward moves. Yeah, the pro- and, and that's also, I, I also get that. I, I, wall of war is a great way to describe it because if it just keeps going up like that, you know it, it happens all the time. You start getting the sort of degenerate traders just going margin long because you, there's this sort of false sense of security that, well, it's always going up, right? So I might as well just like open these leverage longs and then that wall just becomes a vicious sort of like, you know, retracement that really then sends us into like a, a very choppy market at, well, like soon after. So the, you know, the, the stairs up, or I always uh, find more on um, peace with that than the elevator up, so to speak, because, uh, because yeah, once things feel like they're getting too frothy, then yeah, you get all those longs. And it's interesting that even with like today's pullback a little bit, it looks like it's kind of bouncing uh, at 60 K. I mean, who knows how soon it goes back and maybe retest that. But, um, but yeah, th- th- this is, this is a far healthier uh, market structure um, when you're kind of, you know, retracing when the market's been hot versus just kind of going up and up and up. And before you know it, the floor kind of falls out beneath you. And you're absolutely right in that the ETFs have kind of changed, like in terms of the market structure, they've changed everything. And they've made this having challenge that much harder because, you know, there is some consensus that the ETF inflows, you know, they'd be kind of muted. They would be interesting, but they wouldn't really propel much. I think we've since seen that their the inflows are much larger than most people had predicted. And now the question is like, how, how much longer is this momentum going to continue? And is there going to be a flywheel effect, right? You know, as the price goes up, more eyeballs get, atten- you know, eyeballs diverted over to Bitcoin, the inflows keep increasing. So um, it's going to be interesting how, you know, these, these records or these, you know, top two, top three inflow days, how longer they kind of persist, because if they continue to do so, then, yeah, I mean, obviously that would just in- increase the upward momentum. So uh, it just makes that things that much more challenging to predict in terms of where this is all going to be at here, you know, by having time. Yeah. And I think that flywheel effect is just illustrated in the fact that like Bitcoin is a monetary com- commodity um, and liquidity begets liquidity. I mean, the higher the price of Bitcoin goes, the better of a store of value it becomes because of its increased liquidity. So I think that there is like that positive feedback loop. It's like as Bitcoin goes up, it becomes less risky in a, a kind of counterintuitive way. And I mean, if you guys disagree there, feel free to, uh, to tell me I'm wrong. But that's kind of how I see it playing out. Um, and I also think it'll be the, the piece that's going to be very interesting is to see what these passive inflows look like. Um, I know that uh, there's news recently of BlackRock having a um, a, a fund that's uh, essentially like a diversified uh, way of just getting exposure to the market. But one of the things they're including in that is exposure to Bitcoin. Um, I'm not sure, you know, the state of that. Don't, don't quote me on when that's going to go live or, you know, what inflows are going to be like. But I think that passive inflow story is going to be a really interesting thread to watch. I know, like, obviously, Fidelity has... A, um, a very conservative fund that they offer up in Canada. And that is, uh, you know, incurring a 1% Bitcoin allocation as like their most conservative uh, play on the market. And I think that that's fascinating is Bitcoin is becoming the risk off asset because of its properties as, as an asset. Um, and I think that's just going to be fascinating for, for Wall Street to wrap their heads around and for just the everyday, you know, mom and pop investor who's allocating passively to, to stocks and uh, to equities and bonds is seeing, you know, what Bitcoin can do for their portfolio's performance um, as far as risk-adjusted returns. So um, I think that's going to be a really big story. Maybe not necessarily too important prior to the halving, but longer term, um, that's going to be fascinating to watch. And, and, you know, you bring up a great point, and I think that Michael Saylor, uh, you know, has said it many times, you know, many people approach Bitcoin because they think volatility, they think speculation, but in reality, it's not. It's a long-term hold. It's an investment. And I think that, you know, once that culture comes around worldwide, right, that the speculation side goes away, I think that's when we start to see even more people coming into it, like you said, in in those funds that you talked about with Fidelity and so forth and and other institutions. Yeah, and I guess just thinking about people coming around to Bitcoin, I know last time we talked, John, you were telling us a little bit about how Nitro came around to Bitcoin. Um, I know you and Dee had an interesting conversation talking about your Bitcoin roots as it relates to uh, online betting. Um, and I thought that was just such a fascinating uh, instance and 
uh, explication of, of what Bitcoin can do for companies and their balance sheet. Um, so, John, I just kind of wanted to give you another another opportunity there to, to talk about um, like Nitro's history. I think a lot of people have gone to Nitro through the having challenge, but they might not know the full story there. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and so, you know, Nitro started back in 2012 with just a handful of guys and they're basically programmers and engineers, and they just saw something with Bitcoin and having a Bitcoin sports book and casino. Initially, it was just a sports book. It was actually known as a nitrogen sports at the time. Uh, as we evolved uh, and added casino, race book, poker, and so forth, uh, we changed to nitro betting eventually. But, you know, for us, if you think about it, our customers literally just saw a 40% increase in their balances. Forget about, you know, our coffers as a company, but our customers, you know, these are, you're talking tens of thousands customers who are active that literally just saw a 40% increase. And the funny thing that I can tell you is that I'm seeing a lot of trends and I started seeing this in the last cycle a few years back. Um, people, when their balances start to go up, they're betting they increase their wager size. They increase their deposits. Um, so it's very interesting from my side of the business to see this coming in. People are willing to take a little more risk uh, now that their balance is a little bit higher. So maybe that's a normal trend, but it's something that, that's always fascinated me. Um, but definitely, yeah, Nitro, um, you know, look, we, we settle every day, every account in Bitcoin. And that doesn't, we don't plan on changing that model. And we're very optimistic. Obviously, our customers are super happy right now. Um, and, you know, as a company, just to, you know, for the audience, you know, we've grown so much in the past year since I took over. Um, we've just added 400 new casino games. And the timing of this call is great because we have a live dealer casino that's going to be launched in about two weeks. Um, and we actually have a bracket, a perfect bracket Bitcoin contest that's going to be for March Madness. So a lot of things going on with the company, uh, a lot of optimism for the way forward. Uh, and we're really happy for our players. You know, when we see them make that much money just for sitting on their balances, who wouldn't be happy? Yeah, absolutely. And I think like, obviously, as you said, that price appreciation aspect is certainly, uh, you know, going to be a driver for business, but I think, uh, Another interesting tangent is this idea of Bitcoin as this like neutral internet-based money and what that allows you to do as far as what customers you can serve and how you can serve them. Um, and I know, D, you kind of talked about last time about trying to get access to sports betting online, but finding it difficult to navigate the traditional banking system. Um, so I kind of wanted to take us in that direction and just talk about like why Bitcoin is uniquely suited to this type of economic activity. Um, and yeah, maybe that John could that could help illuminate a little bit more around Nitro Betting's choice of using Bitcoin rather than sticking to, you know, USD uh, traditional banking rails. Yeah, we've never wanted and That's something, you know, you know, the one thing that I actually ran a survey, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very customer obsessed uh, manager. And so I always want to know what the customer's feedback is. So we ran a survey actually just recently and Basically, the question was, would you prefer to see your balances while you're playing in the casino or making a bet? Would you prefer to see your balance in MBTC? And obviously, we show it in Millibitcoin. Um, obviously, at one point, it was easier from a one-to-one -one standpoint, but we show it in MBTC. And then the other question was, would you or do you prefer to see it in USD? And, uh, you know, obviously, this is with our active database, but even with new customers that were coming in, overwhelmingly, they felt comfortable and they wanted to see it in Bitcoin. So, you know, that, that's the demographics that we attract. We're not your conventional sports book where you're going to see, let's say, somebody that's typically 25 to 55 years old uh, with, you know, disposable income. We're bringing in customers that are, you know, 20, 20 to 45 years old, 20 to 40 years old uh, with that disposable income. But they also like because of the fact that we've always held true to the fact that we allow anonymous betting. And... There's a lot of coin books out there that have, they started that way, but they moved to tier one KYCs where they ask your personal information. And that kind of goes opposite direction of what Bitcoin's purpose is, right? And so we kind of, I think we're the only one left in the industry that allows that anonymous betting. So all you have to do basically is sign up uh, with a valid email address. And then before you 
request any payouts for your winnings. You just have to do a two-factor authorization. And that's it. We don't ask any more questions. We don't need to know any more about you. We want you to enjoy the entertainment of the website. And, and I think that's one of the things that separates us from the, from the rest. Yeah, I love it. And I mean, that just kind of brings me to, to the Bitcoin having challenge here. And, and that's all, all it takes for people to participate is just entering an email. I have that link pinned in the nest up here. Um, but Nitro Betting in partnership with Bitcoin Magazine is putting on this Bitcoin having challenge where folks can go ahead, place their guess for what they think the price of Bitcoin will be at the having, And that'll enter you into being able to win a share of a one Bitcoin prize pool. Um, when we first launched this, I want to say, you know, that one Bitcoin prize pool was around $30,000 USD, and now we're sitting at around 60 plus. Um, so uh, every day the, the potential goes up and uh, as like a, a free call option with potentially uh, outsized returns, I think uh, from a risk adjusted perspective, it's a great, uh, a great option out there for folks. Um, so yeah, we definitely encourage people to go to BitcoinHaving.com. Um, we have the Bitcoin Having Challenge there and you just enter your email, enter your price guess for the having, um, and then you know, you'll see where it goes. But uh, I think that was uh, something we were really happy to be able to put on with Nitro. And um, being able to work with a company like Nitro that has this Bitcoin foundation is very important to us. I know the Bitcoin industry is growing, but it's still um, not, it's not too widespread. So being able to find a company like Nitro that shares a, a similar ethos um, was really important to us. And I also think for, for our readers, too, like we want to be able to highlight companies out there that are doing this kind of work. So so hats off to y'all for, first of all, being early and second of all, sticking to it. Um, it's glad to see, you know, Bitcoin continues to gain traction, uh, both as an investment, but also as as a technology for facilitating business activity. So um, really glad to see this partnership uh, continue to, to be strong. Yes, absolutely. We're, we, you know, we're well into, I think we're approaching around 5,000 guesses, if I'm not mistaken. Might, be, might even be higher. I have to get the latest numbers. But um, yes, absolutely. You know, and we're excited I, we're happy to give out, you know, if it's 60, if it's 70,000 uh, or higher, we're happy to give it out. Uh, but make sure uh, you, you do have to be eligible to make, after you make the guess, make sure you do open account with Nitro to be eligible to collect your earnings. Um, and we're looking forward to giving that money away. Yeah, awesome. Um, I know, uh, Adi, go ahead. Looks like you, you were about to jump in there. Yeah, no, I was going to say, so we've got my my guess on the record. So I, I said 75 and then John 73. So I just wanted to hear Alan Spencer. I'm just, I, I want to hear a more exciting guess than our sort of very lukewarm down the middle uh, guesses. Alan, y'all are, you, man? <laughs> y'all are a bunch of bears is just I'm gonna, what I'm going to say. 100K <laughs> or bust <laughs> by the having. And, you know, I have no charts to back it up. It's just a gut feeling. That's all I'm going to say. Alan, don't you feel, though, I, this is, and yeah, maybe I'm a bear, but I feel like whenever, like, Bitcoiners, I'm, of course, as I'm broad brushing Bitcoiners, like, like, try to will the price a certain way, the exact opposite. I, like, I feel like when they, the whole laser rate, 100K, I feel like we doomed it because we're trying to just will it to happen, and it's, we're, we're, we're always surprised, either the upside or the downside. So I feel like the co the consensus target is never what happens. So like that's that's my very contrarian, I guess, bear sort of take. Uh, and I know the powers that be, the markets that move, are bigger than just a high mind of how people tweet, you know, talk on Twitter. But that's the only reason why I feel like hundred k. I just because everybody wants it. It's, it's not going to happen. And if it doesn't, it's more likely to happen on to the downside under hundred than going way above you know, everyone's a ball expectation. So, um, but, but who knows? Hey, last time when we did the nitro betting space, we were talking Super Bowl, and, uh, actually we're on Super Bowl. We're talking about, the, uh, um, conference championships. And I kind of put myself out there saying the Ravens would boat race <laughs> the chiefs. So, um, so who knows, who knows what I'm saying, right? Like I have a good track record. So maybe I'm going to, uh, jinx my prediction. Like I jinxed the Baltimore Ravens and, <laughs> Uh, Bitcoin will go to two hundred k now. Yeah, D, you've been eating a lot of crow lately uh, well, on that Ravens bet. So uh, yeah, maybe you can get a breath of fresh air here. Who knows? But uh, as far as my my price prediction, I think I might even hedge myself a little bit here and say one hundred and twenty k. So that way, I get cheap sats when I inevitably get wrecked on that guess. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think 
One of the things that really has been surprising me lately and that I haven't really fully digested, even though I'm like so deep in the weeds on Bitcoin is like, first of all, like what absolute scarcity means um, and how little it's going to take to get us to a certain point in the market. I mean, obviously, like a two trillion dollar market cap is gigantic. Um, but in the scheme of broader markets, like it doesn't take that many flows to get us there. And when you have like 80% of all coins not having moved in the past six months, I, th I think that's about what it was showing on, on Glassnode. It's like you have this base of hodlers that's been hardened throughout the bear market. People that understand what they're holding have accumulated the like vast majority of Bitcoin supply. And now you have these folks that are coming in through the ETFs. They may not even know what Bitcoin is or like what its potential valuation is, but they see it as a momentum trade. But that part of the market is like going to be a very small chunk as far as people that can sell or get shaken out. So, um, I mean, overall, I think like Bitcoin could really go anywhere, which is like such a hard thing to wrestle with. But the point where it's at in the market is like 120K Bitcoin relative to its full potential valuation is so minuscule that it, it might sound outlandish to say, you know, Bitcoin doubles to $2 trillion market cap in, you know, 45 days or whatever it is. But at the same time, it's like that is just we're in the, the very beginnings of, of this asset class. Um, so that's going to be that's my take is uh, it's OK to be hyper bullish. Uh, 120K is a drop in the bucket for where we're going. So um, even though it's, it's uh, maybe a far field right now, I think looking back, it's going to be, uh, you know, a very early step on this journey. Yeah, and in fairness, it's it's always easy to be a bear. And what I mean by that is that if you hold Bitcoin, it's always easy to kind of throw bearish opinions out there because you're just hedging your own emotions, right? So you can sit there and kind of, you know, uh, be all like ho hum and like Eeyore about it. And then if it goes up, then great. I mean, you're reveling with everybody else. So I actually think it takes more confidence to be a bull because you're going to get eviscerated more when you're sort of targets aren't hit. So um, so I will at least tip my hat to those that have more aggressive targets. At least you have the confidence uh, to put yourself out there. Whereas like nobody really goes back and, you know, I mean, unless you're talking about like the mega bears, like Peter Schiff and I don't even consider those people even in the stratosphere or bear because they're just no corners in general. But um, like very rarely do the bears get the criticism that the like bulls do, if that makes sense. So uh, I'll at least uh, lend some credit that way. I don't think uh, I don't think 100k is the the psychological barrier you think it is D and uh, I think the, my, my reasoning for that and this is like a hundred percent off the sentiment and just getting wrecked in too many bear markets now um, but I get this feeling right you know we just we just briefly touched over previous all-time high here 69 everybody kind of knew we're going to hit 69, we're either going to blow past it or, you know, markets are going to cool off and people are going to set their buy orders for like 69 and some change and sell off. And that's essentially what's happened. Now we're sitting at 62. Um, but everybody who's been riding this whole wave up hasn't been fucking retail. It's been people that have either been previously exposed to Bitcoin um, or, you know, have like been on the sidelines, see it going up or wanting to get in. And most of the price action has been fueled by, you know, ETF interest. And so I guess it's kind of more of a question for John and just, you know, curious from like the, the sports betting side of things, seeing if you've had any users that have, uh, you know, been on the sports betting lines come over to some of the Bitcoin betting lines, um, asking to see if there's any correlation there. Because I don't really think the the like, the retail interest is there. I think once they're here, you know, we go back again above 69, 70, 100 is going to smash right through. Like the, the retail buyers are just going to be all over it and there's going to be no barrier to stopping it. You know, it's, it's a great question. You know, my perspective comes from, you know, 20 years in this industry. And you have obviously, you know, sports, uh, sports books like us. And then you have the conventional sports books and what I'm seeing, you know, and I'm speaking strictly on when I say conventional, I'm, I'm talking about offshore. So, the, you know, the companies that I know people at and talk to, they're trying their hardest to convert all their customers to Bitcoin. You know, they do offer, you know, credit card on the way in and different options to deposit as well as crypto. But they're not having the success over the past couple of years. They haven't been able to, some of them convert at 10, 15 percent, you know, out of all the customers that they get. And these are big books that have hundreds of thousands of customers. Um, and 
you know, what ends up happening, and this is where it's good for Nitro and, and even some of our direct competitors, is that these companies, they'll get them because you come in with a credit card and then they, they force you to leave with crypto. So they force you to learn to ha how to take that money out. But then they find out that a place like Nitro, where we're giving you free deposits, uh, if there's any fees at all, you know, depending if it's a fast batch or a slow batch payout, um, they're minuscule. And that's what's attractive. So, you know, we've been seeing a higher acquisition coming over from the conventional sports books, even though they're offering Bitcoin, uh, they just don't know how to speak the language. That's the problem. They haven't took, taken the time to educate their staff, educate the customers the right way, and it makes it more difficult. So I think that, you know, we're absorbing some of their customer database as well, and obviously gladly so. And, and, and again, you know, our lines, everything else from a betting perspective, no different. They're just as competitive. It's just that we, we pure, purely each day settle your account in Bitcoin. So um, I think, you know, from that perspective, it's a great it's a great thing for the industry that we start to see companies like Nitro um, absorbing those customers. And I think it's, it's not going to stop. Right. It's going to continue. Yeah, I love it. Um, I, I also just want to give people a chance to take a look at BitcoinHalving.com. Uh, it's shown 40, about 45 days until the halving. So uh, like you said, hopefully we can line it up with that, that 420 halving. That'd be uh, pretty epic. But uh, there, there, there is a chance, uh, folks, to, to cast your vote for what you think the top 21 moments of the epoch are. Um, so over the last four years, we've been through all the ups and downs from El Salvador to SBF and FTX. Uh, to Tesla putting Bitcoin on the balance sheet, to the Canadian truckers protest, just running the gambit. And um, for me, it's just kind of fun to take a little bit of stock of, you know, what we went through and also like to think back on like what my mindset was as I was uh, trying to grok just how Bitcoin was going to impact the world. Um, so yeah, for folks who want, uh, you know, let us know what your top 21 moments are. You can go to bitcoinhaving.com um, and cast your vote for your top 21. And we'll be uh, for the Bitcoin having live stream happening during the having itself, we're going to run through those moments and um, have a nice little trip down memory lane. So looking forward to being able to do that. But, um, you yeah, know, when, when folks are entering their guests for the Bitcoin having challenge, go ahead and also uh, tell us what you think the top 21 moments of the epoch were. Um, we're getting a lot of interest in there, too. So uh, curious to see what the community thinks. I get, uh, Oh, sorry, John. No, I was, I was going to say along those lines. Um, uh, no, no pun intended here. Obviously, it, that SBF prison sentence, John. I saw is on Nitro betting, and uh, Spencer had mentioned it. I'm just curious, like how your uh, bookmakers set that line. It looks like 25 to 50 year sentence is kind of like the the odds on favorite, um, which surprised me a little bit because it looks like under 25 years for SBF sentence is about three to one, and I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. I'm. I, I'm one of those people that are sort of that school of thought that, you know, SPF kind of walks off quietly into the night. Not, not that he's going to get off scot-free entirely, but I think under 25 years actually kind of sounded like there's some more value there. So I'm curious how you guys set the lines on 25 to 50 and, uh, and yeah, just curious your thoughts on, on how that was set. Yeah. So a great question. So obviously, you know, we've got a lot of great Bitcoin minds here. Uh, so, we do have financial consultants that we've brought, brought aboard. Um, and I think you're also right, first of all, on that under 25, because if I'm not mistaken, uh, he came out recently saying that, you know, he's misunderstood and he's asking for, I think, six and a half years or something like that. Um, who knows if he sways anybody's opinion. But yes, uh, based on the data that we did, and obviously that's that's literally where we pulled this info from and to put the lines up, uh, we felt comfortable at 25 to 50, being that they were going to try and make an example out of him. Um, so I think that will stay the trend, but if you're a betting person, I, and I, I, personally, if I was in your shoes, I'd go for the under 25 as well. So I think that there's definitely value there at three to one. Um, and I just wanted to add something, Spencer, uh, you know, two weeks ago, I, my daughter was competing in, uh, the Central American games and she's, a, she's in karate and she was representing uh, our country here. And we went to El Salvador for the competition. And it was my first time there. And, you know, obviously the second you walk through the airport, that, you know, they got pictures of the president, they're promoting Bitcoin in the airport. Um, you get in the, you know, in your car and you go 
not even 20 minutes and there's huge billboards for Bitcoin Beach. Uh, I got to visit it uh, myself. Um, unfortunately, I was told that Bitcoin Island hasn't happened yet, but uh, you know they're still not giving up. Uh, I think that they need to work through a couple things. There's no doubt this president is a huge favorite. I mean, everybody loves him. He's cleaned up the country. It's, he's made it one of the safest countries in South America and Central America. But I got to tell you, the, the average El Salvadorian didn't know much about Bitcoin. And I was surprised. I thought maybe they would. But the more I spoke about it, the more I talked to it, the hotel staff and so forth, there were people that... I didn't expect, and maybe this is just me assuming, I didn't expect to have the knowledge that they have, but they're state aware and they know about the price, they know about the having. Um, and this president is just gung ho. So it, it was really exciting to see a whole country just really absorbing Bitcoin the way it, where they have there. So I just, it's a side note story, but I felt it was relevant. Yeah, and I think that's one thing that everyone's been waited with bated breath on is like, who's country number two, right? I think that's inevitable. There's going to be somebody to fall. Well, it's, it's kind of two things. Country number two, as you look at El Salvador, and then company number two, as you look at MicroStrategy, it seems like everyone is collectively terrified to be the second in line. I mean, we know it's going to happen. Nobody knows the timeline what's going to happen. Um, there have been guesses. Uh yeah, I'm just curious what people think um, in terms of not so much corporate adoption with micro strategy, but yeah, who is probably the most primed country to be number two to sort of replicate El Salvador's playbook? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I think that Argentina is in line. They could definitely, uh, and I've also heard just this is just from recent travels over to the other part of the world, across the pond. I've heard Qatar uh, is actually interested as well. Uh, obviously, they have a ton of money. They have tons of, uh, oil, you know, the princes there and so forth. I'm sure they're already well invested, but I've heard rumors that they could be interested as well. Yeah, I think my framing for this is both does this country exist at the periphery of this monetary order? Um, and so El Salvador is a great example of that. But two, what are their energy resources looking like? And I think with Indonesia, you have the governor of West Java. I believe it's the most populous uh, um, uh, state in Indonesia. But uh, they have like a massive wealth of natural gas as well as geothermal in that part of the, the world. I mean, you have like the ring of fire and the tectonic plates bringing a lot of that energy up to the surface. And so um, I think it's going to be a combination of those folks who are, um, I guess, trying to operate outside the auspices of the U.S.-led banking and fiat monetary system, um, and two, those that are primed to benefit most from Bitcoin mining. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk. Uh, first of all, uh, Qatar has uh, done some work with Crusoe Energy, I believe, um, as far as trying to capture uh, vented methane um, in their, their oil fields. But then you also have um, the UAE has been, um, I've been hearing a lot of talk about them moving largely into the Bitcoin space. But Bringing it back to micro strategy, I know there were some photos floating around of uh, Michael Saylor and Jeff Bezos hanging out. Um, and so I know Jeff Bezos recently sold like eight and a half billion dollars of, uh, of Amazon stock. And so, you know, is he going to sit on that melting ice cube or is he going to put it to use? Um, you know, I'm going to leave that up to interpretation for the audience. But I think that people have been put on notice as to the fact that Bitcoin is something that can benefit their, their asset allocation strategy. Um, and it, it just wouldn't make sense for me for somebody not to take a page out of Michael Saylor's book, just given what it's done for MicroStrategy as a company. Um, so I, I think that's uh, going to be a narrative to watch. And then as well, you have uh, kind of the growth of things like BitVM and basically this race for a bunch of shit coins to try and build layer twos. But what that does is the applications aside, I think it gets a new subset of investors interested in this asset. And that's people involved in the tech space. I mean, obviously that's evidenced by Bezos and Saylor hanging out. But I think that people, when they begin to understand that Bitcoin can be more than just something that you buy and hold, um, regardless of whether or not that, that use case is supported by the market, I think that that possibility is going to get people interested in it. In it. So um, you, you had like Wences Casares, who I think he was referred to as like, you know, the, the patient zero for Bitcoin in Silicon Valley back in 2014. But I think it's kind of prime time for, for that narrative to take on new life again. I think it's been 10 years since Silicon Valley really got to understand Bitcoin. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's what I'm keeping my eye on is one, like the natural resource rich countries. And then two, 
what is the narrative in the tech space? And I think narratives drive a lot of market behavior. Um, so that's one thing I really keep my eye on is, uh, you know, the sailor copycats that might be tech or tech adjacent. Yeah, um, I'm going to say something and you guys will probably never invite me back because you're just like, this dude is just way too bearish. But I, I've tweeted about corporate Bitcoin adoption a little bit and I've been a bit of a bear. I still am in terms of, I guess maybe it's because uh, it's a little bit of sampling bias in terms of my professional background and working with, you know, corporate controllers, CFOs, um, treasurers, and these are some of the most risk averse people on the planet. And like volatility is the boogeyman that haunts them. You know, these people, it's all about slow, steady and status quo. And the likelihood of them, you know, saying like, hey, let's put Bitcoin on the balance sheet, even if it's kind of a very modest allocation to pitch that to their executive team and to sort of like be able to have them stomach the volatility without that executive team buying in on it. It's just it's a career risk that I, I just think we're it's still too early for a lot of companies to really get on board with it. I mean, their job is just stability and, and, and keeping and not, not to really sort of get any up like outsized like gains and things like that. Yes, you can make an argument around stability of the U.S. dollar and then a treasurer's responsibility to ensure that you're just, you're just not sitting on a pile of cash that loses its purchasing power year over year. But I think Bitcoin is, it's, it's, it sounds silly, but this is how they kind of think. It's almost too fast a horse on the racetrack. And most of these corporate controllers and treasurers, um, they just ride, they want to ride on like a slow donkey uh, as I kind of piece together this weird horse racing analogy. And I just don't see um, the next sort of micro strategy and, uh, and this sort of like, you know, um, enlightenment of all of these very, super conservative uh treasurers and cfos that exist within corporate america um now i love to be wrong and i know there's been definitely advancements especially with like fasb and the rules are becoming a lot um more favorable and guidance around accounting for like bitcoin is, is obviously helpful i just i just think the volatility and you, you can't legislate anything around bitcoin's volatility is still going to spook them for quite a bit um, so, so we'll see. I've just, I've heard, I've heard a lot of people's kind of like, you know, tout Mike, what micro strategy, what micro, Michael Saylor's doing, which has absolutely, um, been you know, super beneficial to micro strategy. I mean, there's a moment in time where I forgot what their core business was actually. Um, but I just don't see it in terms of maybe the world that I've, I've been exposed to too closely. Um, and I don't really buy into the, well, it's going to be irresponsible not to, it's like, no, these people, they, they, they clock in, they nine to five it, they open their Excel spreadsheets, they close them, and they want to make sure that things are as quiet and sleepy as possible. And for them to take a risk, uh, I mean, and this is a risk as, they, as they, they see it through their world lens on Bitcoin to the balance sheet, it's just going to scare the crap out of them. And I just think it, we're, we're just, it's going to happen. We're just a little bit far away. So. So I have to kind of rain on the corporate adoption parade a little bit just because that's not, not, not something I see. Yeah. Now, D, I, I just wanted to hop in. D, I'm curious your, of your thoughts on, because I agree with you, uh, you know, coming from the corporate world myself, um, definitely uh, they are more conservative. But I'm curious your thoughts. What about from a transactional standpoint? What if Amazon, let's say, decided to allow you to make purchases, you know, with crypto, with Bitcoin? And, you know, and had a wallet where you can go ahead and, and do that. Do you see that in the future? I, I think that is the likeliest case for um, sort of uh, dipping a toe in the water in terms of like, you know, if, if Amazon enabled like, let's use them, yeah, Bitcoin payments tomorrow, it would be a small fraction of their customer base that would take advantage of it to start, right? Because it would be reflect, reflective of how many people even use Bitcoin today. I mean, good example, Bitcoin Magazine, our company. I mean, we our customers are Bitcoiners, right? And we sell products on our store and we sell tickets and we offer very lavish discounts in Bitcoin because, you know, we're not just doing it just to virtue signal that we're like Bitcoin. Like, I mean, Frank, we prefer Bitcoin over dollars and we want to incentivize people to spend it. So even us, a, you know, blue-blooded Bitcoin company, I'd say our customers only spend Bitcoin maybe 10 to 20% on our total transactions. So I think 
for companies that are interested in exploring on their balance sheet rather than buying it directly. I think that the medium of exchange route is a better route because you just let it kind of happen organically. Let's see if our customers are interested in this. Um, in terms of the value to Amazon to accept Bitcoin, now, I mean, it's the same value that I know we as a Bitcoin business get in that chargebacks are an absolute nightmare. Dealing with credit card companies is an absolute nightmare. So the finality of payment on the um, vendor side is very favorable. And I know some customers find you know, somewhat of a security blanket with their credit cards because it can dispute. So you're dealing with that tug of war. The counter to that is that you're paying, you're, you're paying for that in a sort of end around way because, you know, um, the credit card fees that the merchants have to uh, actually pay, they're putting that back in the prices. So while, while customers think they have a security blanket, you're actually paying for that convenience in a very roundabout way. Um, so I do see medium exchange as sort of the toe in the water, so to speak, for more corporate Bitcoin adoption. Um, it's just something that I think is going to take uh, a little bit because right. Amazon's probably not going to do it unless they, there's an uproar from customers that they want to spend in Bitcoin. Uh, and this is kind of the chicken and the egg thing that I think we have to deal with when we talk about Bitcoin as a medium exchange is like, well, do the merchants first have to, uh, implement it? So the customers know it even exists or do the customers need to bang the door of the merchants uh, and say, hey, I want to pay in Bitcoin. And I think it's the latter there, not so much the former. Um, and I'll even give you like kind of an anecdote on um, the area that I live in, uh, you know, because I selfishly, I, I want to I use Bitcoin. I want to actually spend it. And uh, I went to a lot of local breweries here because I think, you know, it, it's a low hanging fruit as it relates to low friction of implement, implementing a new payment method. You know, you can't go to some like, you know, big, big box store or whatever, you know, there's way too much training, whatever. I, mean, I want to go to like somebody who's doing something very easy. They can have a Bitcoin wallet on their phone, except Bitcoin. And I went to, I'm not even kidding you, all 31 breweries in my location and not one of them was interested. And the sort of common reason, and, and I totally understood it, you know, I, I made total sense to me is nobody's asking for it and it's not worth it for them to implement having a process and training, even if it's one staff member to have this thing, if only, you know, D is going to show up once a month to buy a beer and just wants to spend Bitcoin. So it really has to be sort of uh, consumer driven um, and businesses will be reactionary. It can't really be the other way around. And I know we can kind of go down a rabbit hole there because people say, well, like, you know, businesses are consumers themselves and people are going to want to accept Bitcoin. But I really think in terms of the sequencing, it's got to start from people just, you know, uh, adopting Bitcoin and then wanting to actually, you know, engage in commerce with it, which a lot of other, you know, tangential things to discuss about that in terms of like the silly tax rules that we at least have in the U.S., etc. So I think the medium exchange thing is going to work out much better outside of the Western countries, um, just because they're not burdened by ridiculous tax laws that treat money as an intangible asset. And, um, and then, yeah, and then they will be incubators to see that medium exchange is something that you can actually do with Bitcoin. But once again, putting on my uh, uh, bare hat, I don't see medium exchange as something happening really soon. But to get to your question, John, yeah, I actually think that that is probably the more likely way we see corporate adoption is first as using it as actual money and not just as this sort of investment that goes on your balance sheet, because I just think. I think, yeah, uh, the, the corporate treasurer CFO in America is just too conservative. Yeah, I agree with you. And D, I, I think that also really nicely highlights the uniqueness of MicroStrategy. I mean, and I believe Michael Saylor was the majority shareholder of MicroStrategy as well as the CEO and now the executive chairman. And he basically had this more nearly unilateral power to be able to make this decision. Um, he was able to get buy-in from shareholders, which was super important, but... Um, at the end of the day, like he's a very unique position to be able to make this move from a publicly traded company's perspective. And I think from folks that are able to do that, it is less so in that that company setting and more so in like the family office setting where you can kind of have this top down decision making that uh, people have to fall in line against. And if you can contrast that with a publicly traded company, you have the CFO and the treasurer and all these folks that need to get on board and every single step along that chain just increases the likelihood that that change will not happen. So I think as far as like seeing where Bitcoin adoption or putting Bitcoin on the balance sheet would, would speed up or kind of be the first mover, it would be those folks that have that more unilateral power. 
Um, and I guess to your point, I mean, that may be smaller businesses that have, you know, one or two people making the financial decisions. They can roll that out relatively easily rather than a company like Amazon having, having to jump through, you know, a million sequential hoops just to get people on board. So um, I think the family office standpoint is going to be very interesting to watch as well as the sovereign wealth fund uh, piece. Um, so yes, yeah, it is kind of a, a bit of a conundrum with the chicken or the egg, but I think that that's where I would look to try to find micro strategy copycats, but in a bit of a different form. Yeah, it also helps if you have Bitcoin denominated liabilities too, because then you have less sort of exposure to just holding the asset. Because you know, if you're paying everything in dollars, if you pay everybody in dollars and you get Bitcoin, now now you're kind of exposed a bit to the price action. Um, which if these are big companies like MicroStrategy, they can stomach it, right? But if you're talking mom and pop like stores, I can pay them Bitcoin. That's great. They're paying all their you know bar hops and utilities all in dollars. They now have to deal with that exposure, um, which, you know, in the long run, we all know in the long run, you know, long of time horizon, there's a lot of high degree of confidence Bitcoin will be totally fine, if not even better than fine. But, you know, in the short durations, it's challenging. So uh, what works well, I know, at least for us and our business at Bitcoin Magazine is that we have we have Bitcoin nominated liabilities. We have Bitcoin assets as well. And so it, it, they're, they're pretty well matched. Um, now, I would love to pay everybody in Bitcoin, um, and I would love for everybody to pay us in Bitcoin, which is not the reality, but I think that's for the challenge. And John, that actually reminded me of a question I want to ask, ask you. You guys are pretty much taking in all Bitcoin via your deposits, so I'm curious on your liability side, are you then, do you pay most of your employees all then in Bitcoin, um, and how do you how do you deal with like any exposure you have to your sort of, I guess, fiat denominated liabilities when you take uh, in Bitcoin for your business? That's a, it's a great question. Um, so locally, uh, to be compliant with laws here, uh, with the labor code, and in order to operate out of Costa Rica like we do, we do have to report everything. So basically, uh, all salary employees do get paid regular. Um, but as far as bonuses and things like that, those get paid in Bitcoin. Got it. Yeah. Th th thanks for that info, John. Um, and I know we're getting to the top of the hour here. Uh, and then we kind of ran through, you know, what our prize predictions were. Uh, D throwing some some cold water on my hyper bullishness. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, I hope I'm wrong and can get some cheap sats. Um, but just want to give people another shout out for the Bitcoin having challenge. Um, we're closing down uh, submissions for guesses at the end of the month here. So you have until the end of March to submit your guess for what you think the price of Bitcoin will be at the time of the halving. Uh, right now, we have a one Bitcoin prize pool, uh, approximately $60,000 USD in value. Um, so who knows where that could go to? So it could be a potential upside there as well. Um, but yeah, really appreciate Nitro Betting coming on today, John. Appreciate you sharing your insight as far as running a Bitcoin-based business. Um, I think it's a very unique story that you tell. And uh, again, we're just really happy to be able to offer this to our readers as a, a fun way to celebrate the having. Um, and I think that this one in particular is shaping up to be a time where Bitcoin is entering the big leagues in many ways and kind of people are reassessing their mental models. So uh, maybe to help people along that path, we can get them in the door here and uh, and have them win some Bitcoin too. So um, yeah, without further ado, really appreciate it, John. If you have any, uh, any final words for our audience uh, where they could find you guys on social media, uh, feel free to let us know. Yeah, no, uh, just it was a great conversation. Great to hear different perspectives, different thoughts. I uh, hope the audience enjoyed it as well. Um, definitely. Uh, obviously, check out the Bitcoin Having Challenge, but you can get us on all social media. We're on Twitter, uh, Instagram, uh, Bitcoin Talk. Uh, we're growing our presence there as well, uh, as well as Reddit. So you can contact us there. And anybody that's obviously interested in getting into the uh, props section, you know, obviously there's limits. This is just more for fun and entertainment. But uh, we do still have the props up and we'll keep those up uh, for the next few weeks for your entertainment purposes. But again, thank you, Spencer, for having me on. Of course, John, thanks for coming on. Uh, Dee and Alan, but I appreciate you both taking the time. You guys have any, any wise words of wisdom or uh, Bitcoin alpha for our audience before we head out? Yeah, I reserve the right to change my, my guess by the end of the month. Um, so I'm saying what's the, it's March 5th. I said 75K, so uh, I reserve the right to change that come March 31st, hopefully higher. D's got all the alpha here. One Bitcoin's one Bitcoin at the end of the day, am I right? John, appreciate Yeah, that, that, sounds, that sounds right. 
<laughs> no, I appreciate everybody's time up here today. Um, we're at 62K. Everyone should be feeling bullish and uh, excited at price. We were literally, we literally just broke 62K last Friday, and it's Tuesday. So no one, no one should have a bearish attitude here. Yeah, I love it. Uh, yeah, can't wait to see where we get to for the halving. But uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in, and we'll talk again soon. Peace out, folks.